Shane Waldron gives the Chicago Bears the most innovative and creative offensive coordinator they've had in years, maybe ever, but he's not perfect, and we're going to get a complete picture of what Shane Waldron brings to this team with the help of our friends from Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter, at CoxSports1. You can follow Locked On Bears on all of your favorite social media platforms, including the Locked On Bears YouTube channel, where you can keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place any $5 bet. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. On the show today, we will talk to Corbin Smith, who hosts Locked On Seahawks here on the Locked On Podcast Network, and he's going to break down everything he's seen from Shane Waldron the last few seasons, covering the Seahawks in person, at the games, at media availability, talking to Shane Waldron, talking to the players, getting better access than any of us certainly around here have in Seattle. And we'll find out certainly there's a lot to like about Shane Waldron and a lot to be excited about with him as the Chicago Bears offensive coordinator. But it seems like everybody is praising this as the perfect genius offensive coordinator move. And we, we don't want to just forget like he's not just some perfect coordinator that has zero flaws. There's always ups and downs with any offensive coordinator. So we'll get the good and some of the questions, some of the things to keep an eye on with Waldron moving forward there as well to give you more of a, a balanced, holistic look at this offensive coordinator instead of just waving innovative, creative, young offensive mind, Sean McVay coaching tree in front of you and getting all excited about that. Like, yes, that's awesome. And Shane Waldron was my preferred choice of all the candidates to the Bears offensive coordinator. But there were things in Seattle that you would like to see him do differently or better that we'll need to watch out for with him coming over to the Chicago Bears and see how he does things here. I think it's worth starting out by saying, like, everyone's been trying to read into this Shane Waldron hire and say, okay, the Bears hired Shane Waldron, so does that mean they're keeping Justin Fields, or does that mean they're trading Justin Fields and drafting Caleb Williams? And I, I think people on both sides have been able to make the argument that, oh, because he did this with Geno Smith, that means the Bears are keeping Justin Fields, or because he worked with this type of quarterback or ran the offense this type of way, that means he's going to want Caleb Williams. And I think we can sit here today definitively and say the Bears did not hire their offensive coordinator specifically based on what their plan was going to be at quarterback. We heard Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus talk about it at the press conference. They want their offensive coordinator to have a plan for different situations at quarterback that most of these teams across the NFL have had their starting quarterback miss some games this season and they've needed their backup to come in and play well. And Shane Waldron had that when Geno Smith was hurt and Drew Locke came in and led them on a game-winning fourth-quarter comeback drive. That's part of the appeal for Shane Waldron is that he's been able to work with multiple quarterbacks, lesser talented quarterbacks in the grand scheme of the NFL, and have high levels of success with them, with Geno Smith, with Drew Locke, two quarterbacks that have been cast away by their previous teams, but found homes in Seattle and were able to have, I mean, obviously Drew Locke's much smaller sample size there, but Geno Smith you know, being a 4,000-yard type quarterback and having a really, really strong season last year. Or I guess technically now that we're in the playoffs, it would be two years ago, like the 2022 season, I guess is no longer last year. If we're saying 2023 is now last year, you get the point though. With Shane, like he comes from the Kyle Shanahan, the Kyle Shanahan like umbrella, but really the Sean McVay tree. He was with the Los Angeles Rams for four seasons before he came over to the Seattle Seahawks as their offensive coordinator. First year was with Russell Wilson. Then second year was with Geno Smith and Geno Smith's big breakout year. And then his third season was just this past season where maybe a slight underachieving there, some underwhelming third season with the Seattle Seahawks. And we'll hear more about that from Corbin Smith from Lockdown Seahawks here coming up in the, in the podcast. But he also, Shane Waldron, has a history with the New England Patriots under Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels back in those days. He's gone and worked at a few different colleges. He worked with the Washington football team early on as well. Like he's been under a few different offensive coaches. He's not purely 
a Sean McVay. Like that's all of experiences was a Sean McVay guy, but certainly took a lot of things from the Sean McVay offense and then put his own spin and twist on it. Did a lot of things creatively formationally with the Seattle Seahawks with their tight ends, really getting them involved, the running game there in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's still the nuts and bolts. You're still going to see a zone rushing attack in theory. I mean, we're not even sure exactly how much Shane Waldron is going to just copy and paste what he did in Seattle versus adapt that scheme more to what the Bears have, and it'll depend on what the Bears have at quarterback. But if you look at what he did in Seattle, it was a lot of you know zone rushing like we've seen from the Bears, a lot of trying to set up deep shots for Geno Smith with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, et cetera, downfield, and, but also you know relying on tight ends to be heavy personnel sometimes too and st- stress defenses that way. They attack the middle of the field very well. He is definitely a pass first style of coach, or at least he has been with the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, the top 10, top five in passing rate in all three of his seasons with the Seahawks, they pass the ball a lot. They're also high in tempo, right? They get to the line of scrimmage and get a lot of plays off. Not not like Chip Kelly, no huddle all the time kind of tempo, but just it's a faster paced style of offense. They run a lot of motion that, you know, it tells the quarterbacks things and the motion builds on to plays later on in the game, right? And you'll see them run certain things like in one game and then come back to the next game and have a wrinkle on the previous games, you know, play like he'll come up with innovative designs in that way where he'll do it in week one. And then in week three, he'll take this, something that looks similar, but then have a, a, a slightly different shift to it. So the defense is expecting what he did last time, but now has a, has a riff off of that. Like it's that kind of creativity and innovation that we're looking for from a Chicago bears offensive coordinator that you feel like can help unlock either the best of Justin Fields or whatever potential rookie quarterback they might replace him with. Like regardless of the quarterback that you end up deciding on, the Bears have an opportunity there with with Shane Waldron to put him in a better position with a more creative, innovative offense that can attack defenses in different ways, perhaps, than we were seeing consistently with Luke Getze. So there's a lot to like here. He's a guy who's done it before. We've seen the kind of success. We've, we've seen what he is and isn't as an offensive coordinator in Seattle, as opposed to some of the other offensive coordinator candidates that may have also been high ceiling guys, Zach Robinson and Clint Kubiak, et cetera, but like don't have quite the same level of experience while still Waldron having the same kind of innovation. That's what made him such a strong candidate is you feel like you got the best of both worlds, the guy who has done it before, but the guy is, who is also still young and innovative and creative. And a lot of the candidates were either young, innovative, creative, and have never done it before, or guys who had done it a lot before, but weren't as innovative and creative. And Waldron is kind of the best of both worlds. So I think coming into Chicago, it should be a breath of fresh air. And the, the important thing to remember with the Bears too is like, we've had a lot of bad offensive coordinators on our television screens. So like, even if Shane Waldron is an average offensive coordinator, that still might be the best offensive coordinator of the last 10 years. I mean, not here to go back through every offensive coordinator, but like we've seen a lot of bad ones. And so like Waldron doesn't have to be Sean McVay, right? He doesn't have to be Kyle Shanahan. It doesn't have to be Ben Johnson of the Detroit Lions. Just get this offense like rolling in some kind of consistent way with an identity. And that's still going to be a big upgrade for what the Bears have. It's easy for us to sit on the outside and try and analyze Waldron in this way, but I want to go now in depth to Seattle and turn to our friends from Locked on Seahawks to help us better understand the good and the bad of what the Bears are getting in their offensive coordinator next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed When you place any $5 bet. So whether you're betting on either of these NFC or AFC championship games or any sport across the spectrum, college sports, NBA, NHL, tennis, soccer, you name it, they've got it at FanDuel. You place $5 bet on anything, win or lose, FanDuel is going to add $150 in bonus bets right into your account. So it's a great time to get started if you have not used FanDuel before. All on their app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So to claim your $150 in bonus bets, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get in on the action. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, we are joined now by Corbin Smith, host of Locked On Seahawks here on the Locked On Podcast Network. He's also a credentialed Seahawks reporter for all Seahawks, part of the Fan Nation sites on Sports Illustrated. Corbin, thanks so much for joining us today. And I know right now in Chicago, there's a lot of like universal praise for the hiring of of Shane Waldron. I know you're not as high on Shane Waldron as I think the 
the rest of the at least the Chicago media, the, the people around here are. But you've been covering him for a few years now, day to day. Where where do, where do you sort of see like the bigger picture evaluation of Waldron? How do you how do you look at him as an offensive coordinator? So I'll start with the positives. I felt like when he took over for Brian Schottenheimer, the, the one thing that he did do for this offense that really helped Geno Smith when he became the starting quarterback was opening up the middle of the field, taking more options to tight ends. And this was two years ago. They were getting their tight ends heavily involved. That was one of the big reasons Geno Smith completed almost 70% of his passes. They were attacking parts of the field that they didn't, whether it was because Russell Wilson couldn't do it or they just preferred not to attack the middle of the field with him at quarterback. They were playing their scheme differently, and it was more like the Sean McVay system that you see the Rams run, and that's understandable. Waldron was with McVay on his staff for several years. Where things really started to go downhill this season, though, and I noticed this the season before as well, it wasn't as drastic when you looked at the splits, but it just seemed like in the second half of games, Geno Smith was able to will the team back to five comeback victories. But you look at the adjustment standpoint, it seemed like the Seahawks would consistently get off to fast starts on offense. And then the defense would make adjustments. And then Shane Waldron just didn't know what to do at that point. After halftime, this offense was brutal for most of the season, despite having all the receiving talent they have. Having a quarterback that I still think when he's playing at his best, I truly believe Geno Smith is a top 10 caliber QB. He played like it the last four games of the year, too. And there just hasn't been consistency in the approach. The tight ends were not near as involved. And Maybe the thing that was most frustrating, and I know for some fans this isn't going to be viewed as too much of a negative because today the NFL is a passing league, but I can't tell you how many games this past season and even the year before at times where it seemed like if the run game wasn't working early, rather than keep going back to it, Shane Waldron would just go and do drop back, drop back, drop back mode. And they didn't have the offensive line to do that. It put Geno Smith in some really tough spots even with the talent he had around him, under pressure constantly. It just wasn't playing to the offensive line that they had, and they were not going to be a running juggernaut, but they really made themselves one-dimensional. And that was part of the reason that the time of possession differential was so bad for the Seahawks this year. The third down conversion rate on offense was part of it, but the, the biggest issue was that they just didn't have a run game most of the time. It was non-existent. They were near the bottom of the league in that category, despite having two really talented running backs that did the most they could with what they had. So those are some of my frustrations that I had watching this offense. There are some things in the passing game that I think will be really good for whoever's the quarterback for the Bears next season. I'm not going to sit here and say that there aren't positives to Shane Waldron, but three years in, this offense got stale. It became really predictable in the second half of games. He was one of those coordinators who was excellent with his design plays at the beginning of the game, the games that he had on his sheet, and once he got past that point, you could just see things unravel a lot of the time. And luckily they had quarterbacks, and I'm saying that because Drew Locke did it too, that could make comeback victories late. But a lot of those games, the offense had multiple drives in the second half where they just completely stalled out. So that's the downside with Shane Waldron. A big part of this is, is the quarterback conversation, right? Bears fans look at Waldron as the guy in Seattle who came in and helped orchestrate the offense that Geno Smith had a sort of resurgent success with. But I know you also kind of feel like the Geno Smith development, maybe not exactly the coordinator's credit there. How, how do you sort of split that up between him and the quarterback's coach and passing game coordinator, Dave Canales? I think that you got to give a little bit of credit to Shane Waldron. As I said two years ago, they were getting these tight ends involved more in the offense. They had over a thousand receiving yards from their three tight ends, even their fourth tight end caught one pass and it was a touchdown. And then this year they just seemed to go away from that. So that was really frustrating because they still had the same tight ends. All those guys were healthy and it just seemed like they moved away from that. So I'm going to give Waldron some credit, but I think Dave Canales, especially when you see what he's done in Tampa Bay with Baker Mayfield, almost willing them to the NFC championship game. They were that close against the Lions yesterday what Mayfield did, less than 10 interceptions, over 4,000 passing yards for the first time in his career. Dave Canales, every job that he had in Seattle, when he was the receivers coach, he helped develop Doug Baldwin, Jermaine Kurz, Tyler Lockett. Ricardo Lockett was a solid undrafted guy that he developed. He was their passing game coordinator. Russell Wilson had some of his best seasons during that time. And his quarterback coach 
Wilson played really well for him, and Geno Smith had that breakout season. So I think Dave Canales deserves most of the credit, and Pete Carroll deserves some credit for the confidence that he instilled in Geno Smith. So I'm not going to say that Shane Waldron didn't have a piece of the pie, uh, but I would give him a small one compared to those other two. What kind of influence did Pete Carroll have in this Seahawks offense? I mean, obviously he's kind of been a defensive guy, but like, was this Shane Waldron, it's your offense, you go do everything you want to do, or, or is, is Pete Carroll involved in some of the like game planning there? Like what, what level of oversight was Pete Carroll having on the offense? I think there was some involvement, but even when Brian Schottenheimer was the offensive coordinator, I don't think that Pete Carroll had his hands that much in what was going on there. They did run the ball more towards the end of the 2020 season. You didn't see that, though, this year. You didn't see that with a Pete Carroll offense where they were running the ball more late in the season. They really didn't emphasize it. There were still a lot of games where, oh, it didn't work early. Let's just drop back. You saw a lot of those Rams wrinkles with the scheme, a lot of 11 personnel. They were mixing in multiple tight end looks. Last year, they ran a ton of 13 personnel, not as much this year. But you saw a lot of under center. This year, it translated to a lot more shotgun, and that got frustrating with the run game too. But I don't think that Pete Carroll had that much of an influence because he kept talking about how much they need to get the run game going, and yet there never really was a shift towards really emphasizing that. So – he might have had a little bit of involvement. I think this was Shane Waldron's offense, though. This episode of Locked On Bears is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all of your favorite live events, sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you, and especially if you're going to gear up and go to the big game in Las Vegas. Right now, all Game Time users get a hundred dollars off when you buy a ticket to the game with our promo code Vegas100. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, and you can even see your view from your seat along with a best price guarantee that takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. I've used game time a couple times this season to go to Chicago Bears games. I've used it to go to concerts. I've saved a lot of money and I really love seeing what I'm gonna get with my seat right in my game time app before I buy my tickets. Try it for yourself. Take your guesswork out of buying tickets with the game time app. Right now, all game time users get $100 off a big game ticket with the promo code VEGAS100. Terms apply. Just download the game time app and use that code VEGAS100 for $100 off a ticket to the big game. Or if you're not going to the big game, just use our promo code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. How much do you think personnel shaped what the Seahawks were able to do successfully and not? I mean, obviously, it's always a part of this equation, but when you have three, well, two really good wide receivers plus a, a highly touted rookie in Jackson Smith and Jigba, I can imagine that you give a lot of offensive coordinators some really good receivers like that. You can do some damage with them. But you mentioned earlier in his career getting the tight ends more involved. It wasn't like Will Disley was a household name before then when, when the Seahawks offense really started taking off. And, you know, with this running game issue, Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet may be talented running backs, but not like – all world guys. So I guess, how do you sort of marry, how do you marry the relationship between where the Seahawks have talent and how the coaching was able to use the talent or overcome where they didn't have talent? I'm going to be honest with you. I think when you look at the three years that Shane Waldron was offensive coordinator, now there were some bad fortune in there. Russell Wilson getting hurt his first year, missing some time when he came back, he just didn't look right for several weeks. There was some misfortune in there, but it felt like there were way too many streaks of games where the star players were not focal points. Like there would be three or four games where Tyler Lockett would be really quiet and there wouldn't be an emphasis getting the ball. DK Metcalf, the first half of this year, I know he was getting frustrated. It was starting to turn into penalties and stuff after the snap, but they weren't finding ways to scheme up plays for DK Metcalf, which is just laughable to me that you would not be trying to get the football to him. And then the tight end situation this year, they weren't scheming to those guys very often, particularly in the red zone where Noah Fant didn't have any touchdowns. Colby Parkinson scored two. I think Will Disley had won the entire season. I mean, the tight ends were not uh, involved much down there. So it, it's it's difficult to look at their personnel, especially the running backs they have. Offensive line, we got here. Shane Waldron was still able to get decent production despite the fact the O-line had a litany of injuries this year. But when you consider the investments the Seahawks have made and just the pure talent they have at the skill positions – for them to be an offense that was barely hovering around the late teens all year long in offense, 
that's pretty disappointing. So I feel like for the most part, at least this year, he did not maximize the personnel that he had scheme wise. Why do you think his reputation is so, I guess, you know, positive. It seems like around the NFL, a lot of a lot of teams were interviewing him. A lot of fan bases were like, oh, we want that guy to be our offensive coordinator. And I don't think either one of us is saying here today that he's a bad offensive coordinator. It's just maybe he's not the savior that teams might think. He, he is average at best. I, and, I, and maybe for the Bears, that's going to be a home run hitter. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but why 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 do you think the reputation is is greater than that? Is that just a lack of a lack of people paying attention to a smaller market area in Seattle kind of being out of the, out of sight, out of mind, you know, when they're not in the playoffs this year, we're not watching as much and not get as many primetime views or, or is he just a well-liked guy that has a lot of friends around the league? I mean, do you have much of a sense of, of why he, he carries such a, a strong reputation, even if there's more warts there behind the scenes? I think there's two things that jump out there. One, he is from the Sean McVay coaching tree. And we have seen a lot of those coaches, whether it's Zach Taylor, but with the Bengals, some of the other guys that have been hired from that staff that have found success. And so teams are always looking for that next young gun offensive mind. And so now that Shane Waldron's had three years in Seattle and they were really good on offense in 2022, they were a top 10 scoring offense the first year with Geno Smith as a quarterback. So I think when you add in the system, he came from the coach that he learned under and Sean McVay, he worked for Belichick at one point earlier in his coaching career. So he's been around some excellent football minds and they did have a top 10 scoring office last year. So I think a lot of people outside of Seattle, and again, I'm not going to say that he doesn't deserve any credit for Geno Smith's development. That wouldn't be fair. But I think in retrospect now, even more so than I thought going into this season with what Dave Canales has done in Tampa Bay, I think Dave Canales was the biggest reason that Geno Smith had the breakout year that he did, not Shane Waldron. But I think a lot of people, there's a national narrative. Well, he was the OC, so he's got to be the one that we got to give the credit to, whereas – I feel like the quarterback coach is pretty obvious the impact that he's had at any position that he's coached, but especially the QBs that he's coached. Last thing before we let you go, when it comes to like how the Seahawks built their offense, I realize there's only a few seasons with Waldron in the grand scheme of things, but like, could you get a sense if there were like specific prototypes or archetypes of players where it's like, okay, he prefers wide receivers that can do this or offensive linemen that are shaped like that, or a quarterback that can do this. Like, did you get a sense of like that he had preferences in any of those ways or was it kind of just, he was handed these weapons in Seattle and was supposed to make it work with what they had. I think it's a little bit of a 50 50 there. I think that he walked into this situation feeling, and as any coordinator should, hey, I've got DK Metcalf, I've got Tyler Lockett, we just drafted Ken Walker the third. You know, he's had a lot of these really talented players that should transcend scheme, to be honest with you. These are guys that fit into any scheme. You just have to be able to coach it up and, and get them into positions to succeed. And I think. At least in 2022, he did a much better job of that than this year where it felt like it was really a struggle. I do think in terms of quarterbacks that he is looking for that guy that is going to use all the field. Although this year there were games where frustratingly they were avoiding the middle of the field like a plague. Again, it was just so different than the year before. And it didn't make sense, especially behind an O-line that had injuries, why they were not attacking the middle of the field. And they were trying to make all their throws outside the numbers his first two years, it seemed like they were really attacking the middle of the field. You saw a lot of digs. You saw a lot of in routes. You saw choice routes that worked inside. Jack Smith and Jigba had his moments, but it just felt like they were way too inconsistent with how they were attacking teams. So from a quarterback standpoint, I think if you're looking at two to three years, he is looking more for that quarterback that's got that pocket passer style that can really attack the middle of the field, can make the throws to the outside, And if there's some mobility added in, then sure, you could use that. But his one year he had with Russell Wilson, it didn't feel like they emphasized his mobility much other than bootlegs. Whereas in the past, you saw read options and different stuff to get him on the move. So I don't know that that's necessarily the quarterback that is the best fit with him, which makes things really interesting for the Chicago Bears right now. Yeah, everyone's trying to read into every Bears decision on what that says about the quarterback position. I think they're trying to make offensive coordinator be an agnostic decision separate from the QB spot. But Corbin, really appreciate uh, all of your your uh, analysis here on, on Shane Waldron. If people want to get more Seahawks analysis from you, whether it's things you've said in the past about Waldron or things moving forward on the Seahawks, where can they find your work? Yeah, you can find me on X and threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can see Locked on Seahawks. We have obviously got the video form as well as the audio form on all major podcast platforms. And I also do my beat reporting for all Seahawks on SI.com.
Excellent. Check out Corbin's work for more great stuff there. Corbin, really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Corbin Smith from Locked on Seahawks for joining us on the podcast today. I know you might have been expecting what a more rosy, everything's grand evaluation of Shane Waldron, but I appreciate like the realism from Corbin Smith, right? He's not saying Shane Waldron is a bad offensive coordinator, not somebody you should be excited about, but just come in saying, hey, let's not expect him to be perfect. Let's not expect him to make no mistakes or to never do anything you disagree with as an offensive coordinator. Like now that we know some of the things that have gone well and some things that maybe you'd like to do differently in Seattle, we can watch for those in Chicago and say, okay, does he start doing some of these same things? Do we need to be on the lookout for how he approaches, you know, games as they go on? What do we look for for adjustments? And these are the kind of things that we can hope to hear about from him when he's asked at press conferences and it goes through this whole process of the offseason working on this Bears offense. Like this is all I think really informative. We're not here to just pretend everything is great all the time and, and blow smoke up your butt and tell you that every Bears hire is going to be the best hire in the world. I think it's a good hire. We've established that on the front end. I don't want this to come off as like a negative, we're crapping on on the new offensive coordinator over here. The Waldron is, isn't any good. No, like you said, like he doesn't need to be the top offensive coordinator in football. He just needs to be like average good enough. And I think the Bears have that at a minimum. And he's a much safer hire than one of the first time offensive coordinators that could come to Chicago and make all sorts of mistakes and not be able to learn from it. Like now Shane Waldron can come to Chicago and look back at Seattle and go, man, eh, probably should have done that differently and probably should have done this differently. And now that I got these players, I can do this differently. So just because he made some of these mistakes in Seattle doesn't mean he's destined to repeat them in Chicago. And same thing with the things that went well in Seattle won't necessarily go exactly the same in Chicago because you're going to have different receivers, different offensive line, different running backs, different quarterback. We don't even know who his quarterback is going to be, but at least we know who the Bears' offensive coordinator is going to be. We'll see if we find out soon who the defensive coordinator is going to be. We've heard of a couple of defensive coordinator interview candidates so far. I want to go through those coming up later this week on the Lockdown Bears podcast. Also, we're going to hear from Alexis Kraft, who covers the Los Angeles Rams, to learn more about these McVay coaches and some of the some of the sort of similarities here with what they had in Lugetsi versus what the Bears are looking for from Waldron and why they were interviewing so many of these Sean McVay candidates. We'll get her thoughts on Waldron as well. A lot more of that coming this week on the podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's going to be the best way to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Same place as Locked On Seahawks if you want more of that. But you got to come back to Locked On Bears tomorrow for your next opportunity to bear down.